Um, we now move from the American Revolution to the information technology revolution. Both revolutions have changed the world. So um, I'd like to start um, screen sharing. And I'd like to talk about is the evolution of programming languages and their compilers today. And um, uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, these are the topics I wanted to cover. Um, when I first showed this talk to uh, Mark, he said, uh, you got to put some mathematics in it. So when I looked at the kinds of programming languages and when people had programmed in them and on what platforms, I decided, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to put a heavy dose of mathematics into this talk. <laughs> so you're going to have to blame Mark for the mathematics that's in it. My original talk was much more uh, superficial. Let's start off with the next slide um, on computational thinking. This is a term that uh, was championed by Jeanette Wing. Jeanette is the director of the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. Uh, she's a professor in the computer science department. Before coming to Columbia, she was the vice president for global research at Microsoft. And before that, she was a professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. And she makes the claim that for everyone, we should learn computational thinking uh, because it's just as important as the three R's in our educational system. And she also goes on to say that uh, just as the printing press facilitated the spread of the three R's, what is appropriately incestuous about this vision is that computing and computers facilitate the spread of computational thinking. And if we go to the next slide, um, I have been a fan of computational, computational thinking all my life. And I've defined it as the process involved in formulating problems using abstractions so that their solutions can be represented as computational steps and algorithms. And my claim is that if you are confronted with a problem, the right way of thinking about the problem often leads to the best way to solve it or a good way to solve it. So computational thinking is really coming up with abstractions with which to formulate your problem. Now, having said this, sometimes finding the right abstractions with which to think about your problem can be just as difficult as solving it. And my case in point is, if you want to try to understand how to solve or write uh, algorithms for a quantum computer, you first have to come up with the formalism of quantum mechanics, and then from quantum mechanics, derive the formalism of uh, quantum circuits, and then use those as the foundation for your quantum computing programming language. But I won't go into that in much detail. Let's uh, go to the next slide. If we look at the abstractions, that underlie the field of computer science, we have to include the Turing machine, which was invented by Alan Turing when he was a student at Cambridge University back in the 1930s. After he finished his undergraduate studies at Cambridge, he went to Princeton University to study under the great logician Alonzo Church, who had just invented the lambda calculus. And uh, at Princeton, Church and uh, Turing showed that uh, the lambda calculus and the Turing machine were equivalent in their capability of expressing computations. And uh, what they both can define are what is called the recursively enumerable functions. And this equivalence of the Turing machines and the lambda calculus has been formalized into what's called the Church-Turing thesis that says that a function is effectively computable 
if and only if it can be, compu can be computed on a Turing machine. And um, the term Turing complete applied to a programming language means that you can express any function that can be computed with your programming language. And all general purpose programming languages are Turing computable. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. I'm a uh, big fan of precise definitions. And when you're in the programming language business, if you write a language specification, you and the compiler writer for that uh, language have to have the same definition of the language because the last thing you want is a programmer who reads the language specification to have a different understanding of what the compiler writer had for that language. So let's start off with a few basic definitions. And I've talked about algorithms. We've heard about algorithms quite frequently in the newspapers these days, especially with the uh, colonial pipeline uh, being attacked by ransomware. And what we've discovered is that uh, when software breaks, all hell breaks loose. But for the purposes of this talk, we can think of an algorithm as a recipe for doing some task. And the recipe should be sufficiently clearly specified so that the task can be executed by a person or a mechanical device. In computer science parlance, an algorithm is a Turing machine that halts on all inputs. And there are some people who claim that an algorithm doesn't have to halt on all inputs, but I'm following the definition that the great Donald Knuth uh, promulgated saying that all algorithms have to halt. And if an algorithm doesn't halt, you call it a procedure. So Turing machines can, comp can uh, compute procedures, but only those procedures that halt are called algorithms. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is where algorithms and programming languages and software become vital to today's world. I've seen estimates by Gartner and other organizations that the software is a 400 plus billion dollar a year industry in the world today. And if we choose virtually any area of human endeavor, we see that software is essential to that field. And here I just listed a dozen fields that are reliant on software. And if the software systems that these fields use cease to work, these fields would cease to work. And then I suspect civilization as we would know it would be catastrophically affected. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, just as an illustration of how pervasive software has become to people all over the world, Here's a graphic that shows what happens in an internet minute. And if you look at, say, the number of uh, emails that are sent, the number of messages that are sent on uh, WhatsApp or a Facebook Messenger or the number of texts sent, and you got a penny for every one of these messages that was sent, you would be making two and a half million dollars per minute. So needless to say, the internet is widely used and has pervasive impact on virtually all people on the planet. Uh, statistics are that well over half the people on the planet are connected to the internet. And one of the things that we've seen with the pandemic is that uh, uh, the internet and uh, Zoom sessions and uh, virtual learning sessions 
have become very important to education in many countries, particularly in the United States. Moving to the next session, uh, next slide, please. What most people may not be aware of, but I suspect many people in the, the old guard or in this crowd are well aware, is that the amount of software used by the world, if you measure it in lines of code, is truly staggering. I've seen recent estimates that put the total number of lines of code used by the world somewhere between one and two trillion lines of code. And just to give you a few figures, um, there is a website that lists uh, the sizes of some popular software systems. And on the chart, it says that the Large Hadron Collider in uh, CERN, Switzerland, uh, uses 50 million lines of code for its operations. A modern car with its infotainment systems uses somewhere between 100 and 150 million lines of code. And Google, to purvey its internet services, uses 2 billion lines of code. So we see that the software systems that are deployed in these areas of human endeavor are indeed huge. And let's go to the next slide, please. And as almost all of you are aware, is that the software that has been produced to date has first been written by a programmer. The programmer creates a source program, submits it to a programming language translator that produces a target program that runs on the computing device, and it's that target program on the computing device that uh, executes the input output function specified by the software programmer. There are many varieties of programming language translators. One of the most common is called a compiler, and a compiler just translates a source program into a target program, which is usually assembly language, and then that assembly language is run through an assembler that creates an object module, which is run through a, a linking loader to load other translation units with it. And that becomes the executable that it runs on your computer. But there are also programming language translators that simulate the execution of every instruction. Uh, and uh, these are called uh, interpreters. There are some programming language translators that translate from one higher level language to another higher level language. And sometimes these are called source to source translators. So there's a lot of variety in the types of translators that are used. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to just restrict myself to talking about compilers. Let's um, go to the next slide, please. So again, just to be clear, what I mean by a source program is a sequence of statements describing an algorithm written in some programming language. Next slide, please. And I was once asked, give me an example of an interesting algorithm. So the first algorithm that I thought of is the oldest algorithm that I know of, namely Euclid's, Euclid's algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two integers. And uh, here is a complete program to compute uh, the greatest common divisor of two integers in my favorite programming language, which happens to be called awk. I happen to be the A in awk. The W is Peter Weinberger and the K is Brian Kernahan. Uh, the three of us created awk back in 1977 at Bell Labs. It became one of the most popular programs or applications on the Unix system. And uh, the reason for it is that it's uh, so easy to learn. It's a pattern action uh, language. Uh, the awk program here consists of one pattern action statement. The pattern happens to be the empty string before the print statement, and the empty string matches every input line. And if the statement matches the input line, 
the action in the curly braces gets executed. So the action in that first statement is to print the application of the Euclid function to two arguments, dollar uh, one and dollar two. Dollar one refers to the first argument on the line that uh, you're processing, and dollar two is the uh, I'm sorry, the first field of the line that you're processing, and dollar two is the second field. So if you type in sixteen twelve uh, on your command line, this awk program will apply the Euclid function to it and print the result. And Euclid is written here as a recursive program. And Euclid makes uh, these recursive calls, first calling it on the argument 16 and 12, which is what you typed in. Then it takes the remainder of 16 and 12, which is four, and it moves the second argument into the first position and applies the remainder as the second argument and calls Euclid on 12 and four. And then it repeats this process, calling Euclid on four and zero. And now when the second argument is zero, you get the answer four. So this is a very elegant algorithm. It's also a very efficient algorithm. But what I like about it is that it's a very early algorithm and it's still in use after many, many years. I don't know whether Euclid was the actual person who invented it, but somehow or another, he got his name attached to this algorithm. The next slide, please. And since I looked at the programming language prowess of the people in the MIG group, I had to add some uh, example that might give them something to think about. So I noticed a number of awk programmers in the audience. So I offer this as a puzzle. Here is a complete awk program. What does this complete awk program do? I'll mention the answer at the end of the talk. Awk is renowned for its one-liners. I didn't come up with this one-liner. I saw it in a website that was created by the people who designed the Luau programming language. And they said they didn't want to compete with awk on one-liners after posting this awk program. The next slide, please. So let's go to our compiler and let's open the lid of the compiler and see what's inside. The next slide, please. Modern compilers consist of a front end and a back end. The front end does analysis, the back end does synthesis. The process is done by a composition of phases. And this is the compiler model that uh, Jeff Ullman and I have used since we started writing books and doing research in the field. And this model has persisted even to this day. And I'll talk about uh, the details of this model in very uh, brief terms, but just to give you an idea of what goes on inside a compiler. The first phase of the compiler is called a lexical analyzer, and it reads the source program and chops it up into uh, groups of characters called tokens. You can think of tokens like the nouns, verbs, and punctuation marks of an English sentence. Uh, although in uh, a programming language parlance, the tokens would be uh, uh, the variable names, the operator strings, the punctuation marks, and so on. This token stream is then passed on to a syntax analyzer, which parses the token stream to make sure that it obeys the grammatical rules of the programming language. And this parsing process is very similar to diagramming uh, a sentence, an English sentence that you did in elementary school. And uh, what the output of the syntax analyzer is, 
is a tree representation of the grammatical structure of the token stream. That's fed into the semantic analyzer, which checks to make sure that the source program makes semantic sense. And usually you can think of this process as making sure that the, there's agreement between the noun and the verb in uh, an English sentence or between the types and the operators being applied to the types in the programming language. And the semantic analyzer may add annotations to the syntax tree. It then passes that annotated syntax tree to an intermediate code generator, which transforms the syntax tree into an intermediate representation. And a very common intermediate representation in compilers is called three address code. The three address code is fed in many compilers to a code optimizer, which subjects that intermediate representation to scores and scores of optimizing transforms in an attempt to make the intermediate representation into a form, a semantically equivalent form of to the original version that it got, but one from which better code can be generated. And better in this sense can mean uh, shorter code, faster code, or code that consumes less power on the target machine. This optimized intermediate representation is then passed on to a target code generator, which produces the code generate uh, the uh, target machine code, which you can think of as being the assembly language code, or it's very close to the machine language code that is going to be run on the target machine. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the one before it, please. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, Jeff and I did at uh, Bell Labs was we created theory and algorithms to automate the construction of lexical analyzers and syntax analyzers. And uh, our, I developed some efficient algorithms for regular expression pattern matching, uh, which I had written in some programs like egrep and fgrep that appear on Unix. And uh, Eric Schmidt was a summer intern. Eric Schmidt is the former CEO of Google. And he was a summer intern at Bell Labs. So he took the algorithms that I had devised and put them into Michael Lesk's uh, lexical analyzer generator called Lex. And uh, at the same time, I had worked with uh, Steve Johnson and Jeff Ullman to create some efficient parsing algorithms based on Knuth's LRK grammars. These are shift-reduced bottom-up parsers. But what we did was we allowed Knuth's method to work on grammars that would be easier for programmers and uh, compiler writers to write. And um, uh, Steve Johnson incorporated these algorithms into a syntax analyzer generator, which Jeff called YAC for yet another compiler compiler. And all you had to do was feed a YAC specification into YAC and out would come a syntax analyzer. And the combination of Lex and Yak uh, became two very popular tools in compiler courses throughout the world because they allowed students to experiment with language design because Lex and Yak in some sense uh, represent the lexical and syntactic structure of a programming language. And if we go to the next slide, please. What I'd like to do is show how easy it is to construct, say, a simple language, uh, say, for a desk calculator, just being able to evaluate arithmetic expressions using Lex and Yak. So here is a Lex specification for taking a string of digits 
and turning it into a token num. So this is what a lexical analyzer would do, is if it look for a sequence of digits on the input stream, and a digit is just any uh, a character between a zero and a nine, uh, an integer between a zero and a nine, and the plus sign means one or more. So a number is a string of one or more digits. This number represents a sequence of characters in a source program, uh, which fits the specification uh, specified by that uh, expression. And what the translation rule in the Lex program does is it installs that number into a symbol table and returns the token num as the value of that lexeme, that sequence of digits seen in the source program. And then if we go to the next slide, um, here is the grammar for our desk calculator. It says that we're going to write a sequence of lines, uh, and each line consists of a, an arithmetic expression, which can be a number or a plus sign applied to two arithmetic expressions or a parenthesized arithmetic expression. And these two, these syntactic rules specify the syntax of arithmetic expressions involving plus times numbers and including parentheses. This happens to be an ambiguous grammar because it doesn't specify the associativity or the precedence level of plus and times. But uh, what we did was instead of forcing the grammar writer to write a much larger grammar that has these precedence and associativity rules specified in the grammar, we said that in the prelude to the translation rules, um, we specify the associativity of the operators and the precedence levels of the operators in the order in which they're listed. So the percent left plus after the token num at the beginning of the program says that the operator plus is to be left associative and is to have higher, uh, lower precedence than the uh, multiplication operator star, which is also left associative. These are the standard uh, associativities and precedence levels for plus and times in arithmetic. So if you compile the YAC program with the Lex program, you get a desk calculator. And with the desk calculator, the way it works, if we look at the next slide, it parses the, let's say the arithmetic expression two plus three, this is what we want our desk calculator to evaluate. So it produces a parse tree and I have shown here the parse tree for that arithmetic expression according to the grammar, what we had on the previous page. And uh, it, the parse tree is, the syntax tree is annotated with the values computed by the semantic actions associated with the productions of the grammar. And then at the very top, lines has the semantic action to print the value associated with lines, which is the integer five. So as you can see, it doesn't take that much to construct a front end of a compiler with which you can experiment with the syntax of a language and produce, say, an interpreter to a language. In, I might point out that the first programming, first major programming language 
created was the Fortran language at IBM in the 1950s. It took I IBM, the team was led by John Backus, 18 staff years to create the first Fortran compiler. Now, with the tools like Lex and Yak, students can create a rudimentary compiler in a one semester course in college. And in the 25 years that I taught at Columbia, I had hundreds of students in my programming languages and translators class. They had an assignment at the beginning of the semester saying, during the semester, define and create a new innovative programming language and write a compiler for it. And I'm happy to say that in all the 25 years that I taught this course, never did a team of students who were working together on this project, there were usually four or five person teams, fail to deliver a working compiler by the end of the semester. And it took me 30 years of working at Bell Labs to discover a software engineering process that would make this possible. I can talk about that process later. Students would generally love this course. In fact, it's the reason why I got these great teacher awards from the course. But what impressed me immensely was the imagination of the students in the class, because the languages that they, find, they defined would be languages that I'd never even think of. One of the ones that sticks in my mind is a language called what to wear. With this language, you put the clothes that you have in your closet into a database. You create this language that describes your fashion style. What kind of fashion image do you want to project? It was a scripting language. And then the program it creates is, it looks at the weather report of where you're going to the next day, looks at the clothes that you have in the closet and what kind of fashion image you want to project and makes fashion recommendations of what to wear when you're going to that destination. There were two women on that team of, that created that language because I can't imagine a team of guys coming up with this kind of language. The other language that uh, sort of blew my mind was a language called Upbeat where the B in upbeat is actually a flat sign. And what upbeat did was it would take a stream of data and put music to that stream of data. The um, language guru of that team was a older student who had been a very successful stockbroker when he immediately graduated from college and then it was later in life that he wanted to get a PhD, so he was taking my compiler's course. But he said, the last thing you want to do as a stockbroker is watch the ticker tape uh, all day. So they illustrated their language upbeat by taking the data from the New York Stock Exchange ticker tape feed and then setting music to it. So when the market was going up, they would look for a pattern that was going up in the market data and set bouncy lively music to it. And when the market was going down, they would detect that pattern in the ticker tape feed and see that the market is, uh, the music should be dull and gloomy. And so he said that as a stockbroker, you could then just put on a pair of earphones and listen to the music to know which direction the market is going. And then you could be doing other work while you're listening to the music of the market. Again, a language that I would never have thought of, but these were the sorts of languages that could be created using these compiler tools and compiler technology that I, that went into the compiler framework that I showed in the previous slide. And uh, this made 
teaching the compilers course actually a lot of fun. I enjoyed interacting with the students and listening to their proposals for language designs. And uh, uh, happy to talk more about that, but let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so all the theory and algorithms that uh, went into the phases of the compiler were documented in a series of books that I wrote with uh, Jeff Allman and then with uh, Ravi Sati and then with uh, Monica Lamb. Monica Lamb was a professor at uh, uh, Stanford University. What I like to observe is that in this 20 year time span, uh, the first book was 600 pages in length. The second book was 800 pages in length and the 2007 book was a thousand pages in length. And I didn't have the heart to write a fourth book because the amount of knowledge that you need to write a modern compiler today is just staggering. And in fact, what has happened is that no single individual can write a compiler by himself or herself for a modern programming language uh, from scratch. And I'll talk about this a little bit. The open source movement has taken over a lot of software development and it's particularly true in compiler design. Let's move to the next slide, please. So let's talk about the evolution of programming languages. And I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that a programming language is not is a notation for communicating algorithms, not just to computing devices, but to people. The people part of a programming language is particularly important because the most expensive phase of software development is maintenance and debugging. So you want people to be able to understand the programs that you've written and to be able to extend them or correct bugs in them. And this has propelled a lot of the evolution of programming languages of trying to make programming languages that are easier for people, for programmers to write and for programmers to understand. So let's move to the next slide, please. I just wanted to illustrate how languages have evolved from the beginning of higher level programming languages. In, and I've just chosen some of what I think have been the most influential programming languages in this period of time from the 1950s on. I suspect there will be a few of you in the audience who are familiar with every one of the languages on my list, but I hope there is at least one language on this list that everyone is familiar with. So in the 1950s, we have the big three high level languages created, Fortran, Lisp, and COBOL. As I mentioned, Fortran was developed by IBM, at IBM by a team led by John Backus. The purpose of Fortran was to make it easier for customers of IBM computers to be able to program the computers themselves rather than having to rely on assembly language programmers to translate their algorithms into assembly language programs, which could be run on it. And um, John Backus in particular spent a great deal of time making sure that the Fortran compiler would construct very good target machine code because he wanted to demonstrate that it's much more fruitful for the program, for the scientists and engineers who are using Fortran to write the programs themselves rather than going through this intermediate step. And it was also a lot cheaper for the companies employing the scientists and engineers to let them do their own programming than have a team of programmers, assembly language programmers, transcribe their programs into uh, machine code. LISP was a language created by John McCarthy for AI applications, and COBOL was created 
by the Department of Defense, Grace Marie Hopper was an influence. It uh, was an influential voice in the development of COBOL, and the Department of Defense wanted a language for being able to write the business applications uh, programs that the Department of Defense depended on. And it's kind of interesting that these three languages, Fortran, Lisp, and COBOL, are still widely used even today. But I should mention that every one of these languages has gone through a number of versions. In the 1960s, there was a language called Algol 60. It wasn't used that much, but it was very influential because it used a notation for specifying the syntax of a language called BNF for Bacchus Nauer form. And BNF is basically a context-free grammar. And you saw in the YAC slide, the, a grammar for arithmetic expressions, that grammar is just BNF, Bacchus Nauer form. So it has become a standard language in which to represent the syntax of programming languages. And some people even have used, tried to use BNF to specify the syntax of English, but the syntax of English is very complicated as I'm sure you're well aware. Also in the 1960s, the language BASIC was created by John Kemeny uh, as a beginner's uh, programming language. And in the mid 60s, uh, Dahl and Nygaard created a language called 60, uh, Simula 67, which became the inspiration for object-oriented programming in programming languages. In the 1970s, Pascal, Nicholas Wirth's Pascal became a very common teaching language. And one of the most influential languages of all time was created in the 1970s by Dennis Ritchie, the C programming language. And Dennis created it to implement the third version of the Unix operating system that Ken Thompson had initially designed uh, in a higher level systems uh, oriented programming language. And C has gone on to inspire many languages after C. Going to the next slide. The most popular language for creating heavy duty software systems that are used in operating systems, heavy duty scientific computing, even Microsoft Windows is written in a C derivative that Bjarne Straustrup created called C++. It started off by adding classes, the Simula 67 style classes to C. And now it's become sort of the heavyweight programming language for systems programming. You will see many movies in which uh, the macho software, software developer has a C++ programming language manual in his backpack. And then uh, another language that was developed in the 80s, which was the successor of the awk language that uh, Kernahan and Weinberger and I created called Perl. And that was a popular language. It's still popular, but it's fading in somewhat its popularity because of other more recent languages. In the 90s, we saw the languages Java, JavaScript, and PHP developed in the 2000s, uh, C Sharp and Visual Basic.net uh, from Microsoft became very popular. And today we have languages like Rust and uh, Go from Microsoft and uh, Julia as promising languages for the future. But let's move to the next slide. Um, if you're interested in which languages are the most popular in the world, um, 
there are several measures of popularity. One that's commonly used is the Tiobi index. And the way the Tiobi index computes popularity is it takes about uh, six or seven search engines like Google or Yahoo or so on and puts in the query the X programming language and then counts the number of hits you get for X. So these are the most searched for programming languages on the internet. And in the May 2021 Tiobi index, these are the top 10 languages. You'll see that C is number one. In fact, C has been in number one or number two for several decades as the most popular programming language in the Tiobi index. Java used to be number two. Sometimes it was number one, the contender for the top, but now it's being displaced by Python. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you who, have, especially who have students in uh, school have heard of Python. And then the other languages are languages that uh, you have seen in the previous list. I might mention SQL, uh, a structured query language. This is a language that's very commonly used for uh, interrogating databases. Uh, it's based on the relational calculus model. And uh, PHP is a web programming language. Every web browser has to know how to interpret PHP. Let's uh, move on to the next slide. I mentioned that programming languages have become so complicated and so big, no single individual can really understand a programming language completely. And if you're a compiler writer, you try to use other people's work as much as possible in creating a compiler these days. So instead of writing a compiler from scratch, what you do to create a compiler for a new language is either construct a new front end, if you have a new language, or if you want to create a compiler for a new machine, you construct a new back end uh, for that generates target machine code for that new machine, and you have it take as input the intermediate representations that's produced by the front end. So GNU is a project that was started by Richard Stallman in the 1980s. It sort of became the replacement for the Unix operating system in much of the commercial world. And uh, it also provides the standard C compiler for Linux distributions. It's actually now a compiler collection that has front ends for common languages like C, C++, Objective C, uh, C and so on. And it has back ends for common uh, machine architectures like the ARM or x86 or the PowerPC. And I'd like to point out that uh, the GNU compiler, compiler collection consists of over 15 million lines of code. Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie thought that a C compiler should have at most 15,000 lines of code. So you see, there's been a thousand fold increase in the size of compilers, even C compilers, from the early 70s to compilers today. But even the GNU compiler collection has become crufty and the world has moved to a new compiler development framework, which is shown on the next slide, called LLVM. It was a project that was started uh, in the early 2000s by Vikram Advi and Chris Latner. And 
it's designed around uh, something called LLVM IR, the LLVM intermediate representation. LLVM used to stand for low level virtual machine, but now it just stands for itself. And it uses, has front ends for many common programming languages today and many common back ends. And even Microsoft is talking about constructing a front end for their quantum computing programming language Q Sharp and installing it on LLVM as part of their uh, Visual Studio uh, programming suite. And it's even bigger than GNU, uh, uh, the GCC compiler suite. Uh, you're warned that if you want to do a build of LLVM, you're going to need many gigabytes of disk space just to do that build. So this again illustrates how software uh, compiler development was once an individual activity, but if you're doing it in a commercial sense, you're now probably most likely to do it in the context of some kind of compiler development framework. And most recently, LLVM is used. I might mention that Apple has been a big champion of LLVM um, with their Clang um, C compiler, um, uh, which is implemented in, and their uh, Apple is trying to replace Objective C with the new programming language Swift for being able to program apps in the Apple uh, infrastructure on iPhones and so on. So next slide, please. Let's speculate a little on where our programming language is headed. I often wonder where is a natural language like English going to be headed? Because if we look at English of 1981 and compare it with the English that was used in Shakespeare's day or go back to Chaucer's day, I don't think I can understand Chaucerian English. I have a hard struggle of trying to understand uh, Shakespeare in, in original Shakespeare English. But even today, I have a hard time understanding the kind of language that's being used on the internet in messaging because it's full of acronyms and emojis and so on as a mode of communication. So it's perhaps not surprising that even programming languages are going to undergo radical evolution in the years to come. Some of the revolution may come from what are currently called low code and no code development platforms. This is an attempt to create software development platforms that business people and people with almost no programming background can use. And you're presented with a visual interface. So uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I've actually uh, tried to illustrate how these visual interfaces work by using an example that I used back in, I think around 1980, when I gave a talk to the students in the middle school math group at uh, Chatham Township High School when my daughter was going there. And uh, they wanted a presentation on the Unix operating system. The Unix operating system was just relatively new and there was a lot of interest in it. And so I thought I'd illustrate what you can do with Unix that was cool at that time. So I thought I'd use the example of, let's construct a talking desk calculator using the apps that were on Unix at the time. And I thought this would actually 
impress the students. So I started off by showing that if you take the three programs, DC for desk calculator, which will take arithmetic expressions like two plus three and pipe them into another app called Words, which would take uh, a number and render it into a written number. So we take the number five and translate that into F-I-V-E. And then there's a program that Doug McElroy wrote called Speak that would take words and turn them into phonemes that could be played over a loudspeaker. So I said, let's type the three programs together. That's the symbol for composition of programs on the command line. Uh, pipes were invented by Doug McElroy as well, one of the great inventions of Unix. And all you had to do was say DC, pipe, words, pipe, speak, and you have a desk calculator. And if we look underneath this, next slide, please. What we see is that the desk calculator program would take two plus three, produce five as a number, which fed into words would produce the string of uh, the word five, and then speak would translate that into the phonemes for five, which could be played over a loudspeaker. So here is low code development, Unix on the command line. So it's not surprising that you can do this now with uh, spiffy graphical user interfaces. And if you want to go to complete no code uh, development, you can use um, uh, more canned uh, examples of what kind of software program you want to create. And then you can just drop in software modules into the boxes that are shown on the screen. But this, I think, is just an interim step in the evolution of programming languages. And if we go to the next slide, maybe the biggest evolution in programming and creating programming language translators is using AI and machine learning. Uh, so research, it's not surprising, AI is being applied everywhere. Why not to uh, programming language compiler design and to the creation of software? So there are already systems that will do code completion as you're typing in a program using AI principles. But all I can say about this at this point is watch this space. So, uh, Next slide, please. Uh, let me end here just by reiterating what I think are, if you want to remember anything from this talk, re remember at least one of these, that computational thinking is a critical skill for the information age. You already know that software is vital to this today's world. Software is produced by creating programs Compilers have been used to map source programs into target programs, but the whole arena of programming languages and compilers is rapidly evolving. So what I tell my students is that you, when you graduate, you can't rest on your laurels. In information technology, what you're confronted with is lifelong learning, because if you only remember what you know today, 30 years from now, 30 years from now, you won't have a job. And the last thing I'd like to mention, the last slide, please, is the answer to what does that off program do? I don't know how many of you figured it out that it prints the unique lines in the input. So this eight character program is, a 
Auk mystery. And finally, let's, uh, do we have one more slide? Uh, my parting thought is, this was true in the 90s. Don't open anything that you get from an unknown person or believe anything that you get from an unknown person on the internet, because as Peter Steiner said, that message may have been sent to you by a dog. Thank you very much. Thank you for that really great talk, Al. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I see uh, Ronald Weinger. Hello there. Um, very simple question. I noticed, well, everybody knows certain other languages, C++, C, I'm not familiar with them all, have a concept of the double equal sign and the single equal sign. I believe one of them mentioned is for comparison and the other one is to set an equality. If languages are supposed to make, uh, programming languages are supposed to make life simpler for the coder, why doesn't the compiler figure out that and you just have one instead of having two concepts? Uh, Why was that developed as equal, that, equal, that, instead of equal, just equal? That, that is a great question. And it's amazing how much debate has gone into the design of syntax of languages. When equal sign was used as an assignment operator rather than the arithmetic equality operator, mathematicians were outraged. But um, there are, the history is there that when the original languages started using double equal for arithmetic equality and equal for assignment, when you say A equals five, uh, the natural interpretation of that would be assign the number five to the variable A. Uh, that seemed to be much more natural to uh, computational thinking types than uh, uh, having another symbol. Um, some people have uh, invented syntaxes that uh, attempt to maintain equal as a um, arithmetic equality operator and find a replacement like say left arrow for uh, uh, assignment, but one of the things that uh, is very important to remember, trillion lines of legacy code. And in my, in 2005, I wrote a paper on software and the future of programming languages. And I estimated how much does it cost to write a line of code at that time using the software engineering methodologies that were being used? And programmer productivity, a typical figure was say five to 10,000 lines of debugged, uh, documented, tested lines of software per programmer per year. So I came up with a figure of you know, a line of code costs anywhere from $20 to $100 to create. So if it requires a 100 million line system or a 50 million line system, say like for Microsoft Windows, and you have to pay uh, 20 to $50 per line of code to regenerate it from scratch, the ROI isn't there to replace it. So that's why Windows is still written in C++. And if you're going to do Windows maintenance, you better know C++. Google's most popular systems language is C++. So if you want a job doing systems programming at Google, you better know C++. Uh, although, Google has de developed a nice new language with nice concurrency permittance called Go that is getting some traction. It's that 
boat anchor of legacy code <laughs> that prevents the quick adoption of new languages. And there have been people who've been trying to replace English with a more rational English, like Esperanto, but they've all given up because you can't fight the legacy base. So equal, double equal for arithmetic equality is here to stay. And there's nothing like a debate on programming language syntax to, to raise the ire of programmers. If you've watched the debate on Python and its elimination of curly braces and replacing it by a colon and spacing, and then is it a tab or is it four spaces? People spend all day twittering about all these terrible decisions that modern day language designers are making. And you can quibble about language syntax forever, but I'm much more uh, Catholic in my taste. And I say, let's give the world what the world needs and wants rather than what I want. But, but originally, like in Fortran, there's only one equal and the compiler figures out what the, uh, the, what the program we interpreted. Seems like go, you know, adding the two, the two different syntax is really going backwards and making it more complicated for the programmer who, like you said, is the most expensive link in the chain, giving him double work, having to decide, well, do I mean this? Do I mean this? Did I get it right when I put it in? Or is it, do I have to go back 3,000 lines of code and check to make sure that uh, I, you know, I, I, I didn't, you know, hit the key twice instead of once. Ron, I, I appreciate your point, but I think uh, it's been an issue that's been well debated and hashed, and I don't think we'll ever see that change in existing languages that will have a reversion of uh, or overloading the equal operator again. Uh, Martin, you've had your hand up. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Alf. Hey, Bob. Um, <clears throat> See, a wiki lists about 700 programming languages. You know, other estimates put them, you know, 10,000 or so, probably not counting the 625 or so invented in your class. Um, say you had to pick five and throw away all the rest. Which five would you pick? <laughs> well, there's nothing like asking a group of programmers, software developers, what is your favorite programming language to create World War III? I, I just wanted you to launch the first grenade. <laughs> so you want me to start off World War III, especially with such a talented audience of programmers. Absolutely. But, but if I had to pick one language, my favorite language, it's got to be awk. No, no, you got to pick five, Alfie. <laughs> got to pick five. Well, let me uh, mention that um, uh, I, the first programming language I ever wrote was assembly language for an IBM 7090 computer and not my favorite language. <laughs> right. uh, when I got to Princeton, the first language that I was exposed to was IPL five and it wasn't that much above assembly language in my book the next language that i got exposed to was snowball four and i said gee i kind of like this string oriented programming language and in many ways or in some ways snowball four was an inspiration for awk but i still wouldn't put it as my favorite language um and then uh when c got developed I got very fluent in C. I have C hardwired to my fingertips. <laughs> and this is, by the way, K and R C. And then I gravitated to uh, ANSI standard C. I, God only knows what uh, C17 looks like because I stopped reading the 
five or 600 page language definition manuals for C. I just couldn't keep up with the evolution of the language. And if we look at, um, I've written a lot of Fortran programs, but again, it was Fortran 4. And Fortran has gone through nine versions between Fortran 1 and Fortran 2018. Fortran 2018 is now classified as a multi-paradigm programming language. So can I talk about ancient languages or modern languages? I try to keep up with Python because Python gets used a lot in academia these days. So, but even the leap from Python 2 to Python 3, they're not compatible languages anymore. So I have to change my Python 2 programs into Python 3 syntax to run them on the Python 3 interpreter. So it's still a mess, but so are natural languages. Hey Al, I have to point out that um, for a while, AWQ was definitely my favorite programming language. And you and I hadn't didn't really know each other at that point. Uh, although for a while your office was next to mine at Belcor, but this was probably before you came to Belcor. Um, but I actually wrote a significant application once for Belcor in AWQ. And that was a, uh, a course registration system for their in-house uh, education department, which was a whole, like a whole school. You know, They had a whole catalog of courses they would run. And um, they wanted to be able to, you know, this was before the internet. This was before the World Wide Web. I'm sorry to say it's before the World Wide Web, but the internet was there and people had computer terminals and they were all connected, you know, to central computers and so on. And so I wrote a system in AWQ that allowed people pre-web, so this was not visual, it was all based on character, screens. P people could go to the uh, education department's catalog and find courses and they could register for them and they could see what they're registered in. And it, and it was all written in AWQ and, and, you know, in some Unix command line stuff. So, uh, so that was fun. I later, now, I, you know, I confess I, I, I graduated or whatever. I, uh, I moved to Perl for my fast prototyping. Walk is great for quick prototyping, and so is Perl. And, uh, and I still, to this day, use Perl a lot because I'm always prototyping. I'm never writing serious production code. That, that's just a little bit of my history. But let me, before, I and mean, you may comment on those things, but before you do, let me just make this one point about measuring lines of code as a measure of anything in the world. You know, how many lines of code? You know, there, as you know perfectly well, there, there's uh, low level programming languages and high level programming languages. And the lowest level is machine code. So each atomic operation is a line of code, you know, adding two numbers together. And then there are high level languages and Fortran, you know, was for its day was pretty high level. So you could write one line of code and it would in effect generate you know, the hundred lines of machine code to, to carry out that one operation. So do you count that as one or you count as a hundred? And now the now in the world, there are much higher level program programming languages than in that, the way, you know, you write a simple line of code it effectively activates a million lines of some sort of underlying thing. And, you know, for for a lazy software developer like me, you know, my, my way, my favorite way to write, say a Perl program or something, it does something interesting or exotic. I first, Google to see whether somebody else has already written the core of what I need. And then I just pull that in from the internet, from somebody else's work. And now it's just a function and I just call it. So I only write one line of code. So, you know, is that one line or is that a lot of lines? <laughs> no, so I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, obviously lines of code is a good way to think about things, but I'm just saying, you know, that there's a lot of more stuff under the hood when you're talking about lines of code. And by the way, you know, you could say of uh, bringing in a function or, you know, that somebody else wrote, wrote and bring it into yours, uh, you know, maybe you've got the atomic, the lower level code embedded in it. So it's now you could count those lines of code. But, but then, you know, popular things like functions and subroutines eventually get incorporated into the language itself so that uh, it, is, it is no longer an external subroutine. It's just an operator in the language. And then I guess you have to count, count it as one line at that point. Anyway, enough said. Uh, we, we have somebody on the phone that can't raise their hand. Uh, Thad, do you have a question? Yeah, you got to unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Got you. All right, great. Uh, 
Al, you were mentioning that 15,000 lines of code for C, and then there's billions for Google search. Now, I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the number of states would go up between those types of codes where the lines of codes increase. And that makes verification of the code extremely more difficult. And in that case, I would have expected there to be um, a lot of traps in the billion lines of code, and then you'd be crashing a lot. But yet, when you go on Google and you do searches, I don't see any crashes. So how, how do they verify those billions of lines of code so you don't get trapped into some type of a state that you get locked in? Well, um, verification of software, of course, is a uh, very important issue. And it's also a very difficult issue. If you look at what does this program do, from a theoretical point of view, it's undecidable whether two programs are do the same thing. So uh, this is why it's very important, at least in writing code, to put comments explaining what uh, your intent was and what your general approach was uh, so that anyone who comes after you uh, will have an easier time of maintaining the code uh, if something goes wrong. Um, a story about software verification. Um, People have been looking at ways of automatically verifying properties of software for a long period of time. And I'm reminded of this story that uh, uh, Gerard Holtzman, who used to work in the Computing Science Research Center at Bell Labs, he developed a model checking program called SPIN. And <clears throat> SPIN could be used to um, verify um, C programs, um, and it would be able to detect things like, um, are there dead locks or live locks in this program? And the way SPIN really worked was you used a temporal logic formula to specify a property that you wanted the software to have. So if you wanted to verify that the software did not have a deadlock, you could write a temporal logic assertion that says for every state that the program can get into, there is a successor state, which effectively says that the program will never deadlock. And there's a very intriguing and fascinating theory of how you go from uh, a temporal logic formula expressing, expressing a temporal assertion like that into uh, a Buki automaton, which is a type of finite automaton that you can use to uh, verify those properties. And uh, the um, Gerard Holtzman, uh, his contribution to SPIN was to make it very efficient to be able to search the states that a program could get into and for each state check to make sure that that assertion still held true. Um, uh, so a lot of good, hard software engineering and making SPIN run fast. And SPIN was used, and I think probably still is used widely around the world to verify um, software systems like the Dyke control system in uh, uh, the Netherlands or train dispatch systems to make sure that a train doesn't uh, run into another train and things of mission critical uh, software. Um, one interesting question in software engineering, which I was fond of asking is any software development manager, what is your quality plan? This is what I learned from Bob Martin, who was very, a superb software development manager. Uh, when he was at Belcor, he 
for those people who had to work under Bob, knew that he had a fetish for making uh, software efficient and fast and having an effective software engineering process. Um, but if you're importing software, say on a commercial scale, you do have a software quality plan for your internally developed software, but do you use that same software quality plan for external software that you incorporate into your systems? And what is of interest is, uh, again, when I was at Belcor, I was interested in who writes the most error-free software in industry or what industries produce the most robust software, software with the least defects per million lines of code. And there was an organization uh, run by Capers Jones where you could participate and you could publish your defect densities to Capers Jones along and other companies would do the same. And then they would plot a chart saying, how do you compare with your peers anonymizing all the data. And uh, what he noted was that there were two industries that produced ultra reliable software, the software for um, deep space missions produced by NASA and software produced for therapeutic medical systems. Because if you make a mistake in software in a pacemaker or a device that dispenses radiation, you can uh, kill a patient. And the last thing you wanna do is kill a patient because of a software defect, because you'll be sued to death if you do so. So those organizations had defect densities that were measured in the low number of single digits of defects per million lines of code. Whereas the standard commercial software, including 5ESS, the defect densities were maybe a thousand defects per million lines of code. Not even with that, they were able to achieve uh, five nines reliability, but the most flaky software uh, they found were software produced for Christmas games, computer games, because you delivered what you had running at the beginning of September, October to the market and to the heck with uh, reliability, because <laughs> if you miss the Christmas market season, you didn't have a product. <laughs> so uh, the issue is uh, the reliability of the software you produce, I think, is heavily influenced by the business that you're in. And if you're doing it for yourself, uh, you may be more lax than others. But having said this, uh, uh, Paul's story reminds me of a story that I had at Bell Labs uh, shortly after, or somewhat after Auk was released. I walked into my office one Monday morning and there was somebody sitting in my, the chair, the guest chair in my office. And even before I could sit down, he started berating me saying, you ruined three weeks of my life. Shame on you. I said, I beg your pardon. And this, engineer was from the uh, microelectronics software division of Bell Labs at the time. And he had written a CAD development system in AUK. It was several thousand lines of AUK. And he had spent three weeks looking for a bug in his program, only to discover it was a bug in the AUK compiler. So that's why he was in my <laughs> office to... Mm express his displeasure to me. But uh, Kernahan Weinberger and I thought that you'd never write anything more than a two or three line awk program. <laughs> but after this episode, I mentioned to Brian that maybe we should pay some more attention to software reliability. So from that point on, <laughs> we put in a regression <laughs> test suite for awk that would test each of the major features of the language. So it was, one click, build and test. And uh, I, one of the things I did with my students, the reason they could construct a working compiler in the uh, course of a semester was that 
they had to have a one of the people on their software development team be in charge of the development environment. And the first thing that that software development uh, manager on the team had to do was construct a make program for one click build and test for the entire team to use. So as they were creating the language, every time there was a modification to the language, they had to run the build and test program. So this is why everything was working at the end of the semester. And um, I highly recommend that. This again was something that Bob Martin said is a very good thing to do. And so from personal experience, I would recommend that to any so real software developers in the audience. I don't know how you enforce that with uh, open source software though, uh, because you, if you incorporate a, an open source system, um, you really don't have the luxury of time of reporting the error out to the field and wait for some volunteer to fix that bug if you're working on uh, uh, important mission critical software systems. So usually you hire some company uh, that will be able to uh, manage your open source uh, software and uh, there are companies like Red Hat that I think uh, are very good at doing this. Or well, you, you, offer you reminded me. You reminded me of something in the uh, hardware end. Um, so software has this problem, but hardware has this problem as well. And there was a case where, in, and it's a mission mission critical system, just like you were implying. It was in the operating room and the, the patient died and, they, and the family sued and they traced it to an electronics component that was in one of the machines. And that IC chip did not satisfy the three or five sigma. And since then, when they issue hardware integrated circuits for medical equipment, it has to be guaranteed to meet the the five sigma criteria. And if it doesn't, it doesn't go in. So it's interesting, even on the hardware side, there's issues that come into play as well as on the software side where things can fail miserably. Um, I, I just like to make the observation that uh, although uh, Alejo and Bob Martin uh, were both at Bell Labs and Belcor, and they were closest to friends. Um, Bob was running the software factory, producing the you know this commercial grade software that, for running the telephone system. And Al and I were in research, so so all of their software quality requirements uh, didn't cover research. We could write buggy coded if if we wanted to, and nobody was going to slap our wrist. <laughs> um, Griff has a question. Unmute yourself, Griff. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I worked at the Business Analysis Center at uh, Bell Labs. And one of my reputations, other than my being sort of, sort of short fused, <laughs> was that uh, I was often good for a factor of 10 and sometimes for a factor of 100 in code. Um, my impression was that there were a lot of people out there who didn't understand the semantics of what they were doing. And they would write software that had no idea about how the components of the software that they were using interacted with things like the operating system. Um, the worst case I encountered was when someone came to me saying, we need three of our big servers for a month to do an analysis. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> um, what are you doing? He showed me the program. It was uh, C code, but a lot of, uh, calling libraries and running processes. And I sort of choked. 
said, okay, uh, talk to me tomorrow with some more details. I, I need a copy of your program and I'll work on it. The next day I trashed what he was doing and replaced it with some fairly care carefully designed pure C and not calling the operating system unless it absolutely had to. And I got a factor of 3,600 out of it. So the program, instead of running in one month, took 10 minutes before I went home that evening. <laughs> uh, people really have to understand the implications of what it is they're doing when they're calling function, calling system utilities, for example. You're, you're obviously an enlightened software developer, Griff. And uh, the problem that I've noticed is that there are all that many enlightened software developers in the world. I hope that's changed, but uh, I often wonder whether in the area of software development, the difference between the very best person and just the average good person is bigger than that of any field of human endeavor. Because when I watched Ken Thompson write software, not only was he fast, but he was very discriminating in his taste of how he wrote the program. And if he didn't like how his architecture was evolving, he would often rewrite what he previously did in the following weekend and have the version that he really wanted to have written as the basis point. And you don't have that kind of luxury in many uh, uh, arenas. And Thompson was the only person I know who could produce 80 to 100,000 lines of source code flawlessly in a year. Mm, yeah, I never could do that either. About the best I could do was about 10,000. Along those lines, Al, would, would you, does anybody, or would you make any distinction between uh, software development and coding? I mean, in my mind, you know, a software developer is somebody who analyzes a problem and breaks it down into procedural steps, the way you were talking about, you know, really creating algorithms, but at, a, at an English language level, and then sort of debugging them uh, conceptually to see if they made sense. And, you know, make sure that you, you really know what it is you want to compute. And then you go and write some code to do it. And sometimes, you know, uh, somebody who's focused more on just writing the code just sort of jumps in and writes code without thinking about whether it's a sensible way to go about to do, doing that calculation. You're pushing a hot button, and I don't make myself very popular amongst <laughs> theoreticians. As I say, I'm a big fan of what Donald Knuth said, that the best theory is motivated by practice and the best practice by theory. <laughs> but I notice that there are very few people who have towering reputations in both theory and practice. Knuth may be one. I think von Neumann was another. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of algorithms that I see that get published that have very good theoretical running times, but they're not the ones that you'd want to implement. And then I see a lot of software coders who sling code at a problem until they don't get any more error messages from the <laughs> compiler, but they have no idea of how the resulting program works. So there are extremes between the two, mm -hmm. but I think uh, there's a lot to be said for having the software developers write their own code because they have a better understanding of what the code is supposed to do than just handing over uh, a specification to someone and say, okay, code this up. Because frequently when you're implementing the code, you say, oh, there's something wrong in the specification. Right. I'm, I got a couple of things to say about, um, you had this one slide on low code and no code. 
programming. Yes. So actually, you know, in, in Whippany, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, they were building a processor, a DSP processor to do signal processing for the Navy. And it was to replace what IBM, the first iteration which IBM had built. And the IBM processor, they basically had to code up uh, mathematical algorithms and assembly code, which was very time consuming. You had to worry about timing, timing loops and how long things take and how they fit, you know, the, 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 whoever was dealing with the mathematics had to worry a lot about the, uh, you know, the hardware aspects of, of a DSP. And what they had proposed is to build a, um, basically a systolic processor, which is basically like a pipeline array processor where data just flows from node to node and sits in buffers until the next processing and the next node is freed up to take more data. And to program that up, they had a, um, they used a blit terminal and built a, something called GRID, which stood for graphical editor. So basically whoever would write the code would just work with, you know, squares and circles and connecting lines and defining what operations are being done. And it would convert it into, you know, whatever machine code was necessary to run this, this processor. So that's, um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. It was done, you know, it's basically a graphical way of designing code. Yep. So I don't know if you ever heard of that or heard anybody else do something similar to that. Uh, there, there, there were some of these kind kinds of software development environments that have been created for um, specialized environments. I don't know whether you ever ran across query by example. Uh, that was another way of uh, being able to program software queries by trying to emulate certain example ways of uh, asking questions of a database. Uh, it really didn't catch on as much as SQL did, mm -hmm. but uh, um, it's, uh, it's a, a natural approach, but I don't know whether you can get the kind of re reliability or flexibility that people really need for sophisticated applications out of these kinds of uh, low code or no code software development environments. And I also wonder about that, about uh, using AI and machine learning to generate software because uh, we are always questioning of, do you, will you drive a uh, autonomous vehicle that has been programmed by AI? Will you trust your life to it? And uh, the AI folks can't guarantee the behavior of the programs that they produce. So are we going to then live with this uncertainty? Um, on the other hand, there's still uncertainty. And if you have a 10 million or 100 million line software system, um, does it work as you think it does? So there's uncertainty in all aspects of life, it seems. And the other thing I wanted to mention is in, in the wireless area, um, <clears throat> they had a group in Swindon use a CASE tool, which stands for Computer Aided Software Engineering. And basically they worked with high level specification of how systems should work and it would generate gobs and gobs of code. And one of the things it had to do was set up a, um, um, set up a call for a wireless handset, and that should take under 200 milliseconds. And it was taking like four minutes, which <laughs> meant it certainly didn't meet spec. And then it was handed off to Nuremberg and Nuremberg didn't have the time to rewrite everything, but they eventually had to go through like line by line and just take out a lot of empty routines that were just being called, not doing anything. They were just part of, this, part of the structure. And, um, and, and the other thing I, I, I wanted to mention also, just from a practical point of view, when I was working with C, 
um, you know, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> inadvertent errors that programmers can put into C that, you know, it'll pass the compiler, at least the, uh, you know, the uh, KNR compiler. And, um, and the program would run, but if it ran for a long enough time, it would crash and it would crash randomly. It, would, it was never possible to uh, isolate what the problem was or at least very hard to do that. And, uh, and at some point the department bought this software tool called Purify and Purify was compiled in with the C compiler. And, um, <clears throat> and, um, and what it would do is it would, it would check, every, I mean, it would check everything. And a lot of the problems that were caused by was variables that were uninitialized and meant to hold pointers. And there'd be a line of code saying, well, if zero, make a new instance of this pointer, if not use it. And of course, if it's on the stack, in the beginning, the, these values will be zero, but over time they'll be non-zero. Non so these uninitialized pointers were causing core dumps. And it was just like one of many things that it would clear up. I mean, it would save lots and lots of time, you know, for programmers trying to debug their code. And um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, other aspects about, um, you know, the practical implication uh, implications of coding, you know, getting reliable code. So I take it you've heard of Purify and, and have used it or? It was a standard tool for C++ program for many years. Okay. And okay. Uh, there's also a big debate on uh, who should do garbage collection. Should it be in the language or should it be managed by the user? That gets into the issue of language design. And can it be incremental? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the one question I always had to ask the list programmers because they were using symbolics is why, why does the program have to stop and do a garbage collection? You know, um, somehow it seems to me that the program should know when something wasn't being used anymore and just, you know, free it up automatically because uh, I, re I remember a simple construct used in um, in C++ that every time somebody used something they would increment um, you know it was a class that was a base class and if it was used um, passed on to another part of the program it would um, tell it that it's using it and it's and it had a built-in counter. So if it got passed onto something else, it would increment that counter as well. And when and of course when each part of the program got was done using it, it would say, okay, this can be freed, but it would only be freed when the count got down to zero. So that means there was nobody referencing it anymore. So that was kind of like a built-in garbage collection done by you know, very easy object oriented paradigm. But um, so anyway, um, do we have any other questions by anybody else? What's the next new big programming language going to be? Um. Is there going to be a language after C plus plus twenty? <laughs> I actually read Bjorn Straustrup's uh, uh, article on the history of C plus plus twenty, and uh, my mind boggles at how complicated the language has become. But on the other hand, talking to some programmers at Google. They say there are some Google applications where in order to get the performance, C++ is the only language of choice uh, today. So one of the strong points of C++ is that 
you can write C++ programs that are as efficient as any program you can write for any programming language. Yeah, you know, I, that sort of goes back. I remember the days when C was being developed in Murray Hill and it was the successor to B, uh, which had been the sort of programming language developed for the predecessor to Unix, which was written by somebody. Oh, no, B, no, I'm sorry. B was the successor to BCPL. That's right. And uh, BCPL was da, 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 da. But anyway, those guys upstairs on the fifth floor, one, and, and you were one of them, I guess, <laughs> wanted to, uh, you know, strip things away and start simple on mini computers instead of all that overhead. And I, I remember Steve Johnson, is no Steve Johnson? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was, was he one of the people named Johnson? Who is that? Steve Johnson, yeah. Oh, Steve Johnson. I remember him giving C one of those seminars. I think he must have been involved with some of that work. And I remember him giving a seminar and showing, or maybe I'm confusing him as a long time ago. Maybe I heard Ken Thompson talking. We used to have those seminars all the time. And it would not only be for the people in your department, but for the other departments nearby. So the math people would show up for the computer science, et cetera. And, uh, you know, and he was showing, I remember him showing, you know, Fortran is all high level. And then we have assembly code, it was all very low level. And then we have this new thing we're working on called, which we're gonna call C, if they already had a name for it. And, and you can put in both low level and high level statements in the same piece of code. So you can get your efficiency, but uh, you can get your, you, you can code it so it'd be fast, but you can also get the, uh, the program efficiency of being able to, to, to write high level statements instead of writing out the individual steps. So, you know, at the time it seemed like a new idea and it's so fundamental now. Yes, that is true. In fact, uh, when I look back on what I just talked about, I say, this stuff is all old. Nobody would be <laughs> interested in this because it's all so well known. Because we're old. <laughs> <laughs> but then I said, well, maybe this audience will uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Well, well, Al, I have, to, I have to thank you. I mean, this is such a, an illuminating talk and it, it, it's also a wonderful memory trip over, you know, all those years of development. And, you know, I didn't program in all those languages and I didn't know all those people, but, you know, I've been sort of following this history. It's great. It's wonderful. Thank you. By the way, I was flabbergasted at the list of languages some people have programmed in. Uh, <laughs> or it, dabbled in. Or, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, I don't see any hands going up. So I guess we'll call it a wrap. Great. Uh, well, I think I've overstayed my welcome as well. So uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, if you have any programming language thoughts, great thoughts, uh, send them to me. I'm uh, always trying to make uh, programming languages or a talk on programming languages more appealing to uh, general audiences. And um, one of the interesting aspects of the, uh, the whole languages area is I once gave a talk on unnatural languages. <laughs> and uh, there have been I think uh, there was a woman who had just compiled a book of several hundred unnatural languages that had been developed in the last thousand years. Um, and uh, it had some interesting languages on the list. You may have heard of Esperanto is mm. an unnatural language, but it was interesting that in the book was also the Klingon language from Star Trek. <laughs> and I think uh, her husband was somebody who taught actors how to pronounce Klingon correctly. So uh, there's a whole genre of entertainment languages that 
might make for an interesting talk. Maybe it would be a, more suitable for a general purpose talk. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an area I would like to pursue uh, that you sort of alluded to, obviously not for today, but you were talking about how English is so, is so complex it would be very difficult to write a formalization in sort of computer algorithmic terms that you could run through Yak or whatever. But how do all of the modern natural languages in all the countries stack up in terms of, of, the, of their simplicity of formal structure? A talk for another day. Is English worse than most, or is it somewhere in the middle, or is it pretty good compared to Russian or Chinese or whatever? <laughs> My most telling question about English is I've asked every uh, English teacher that's willing to talk to me, <laughs> what part of speech is run in the sentence C spot run? So you take a grade, a grade one primer. The first sentence is C spot, spot is a dog. The next sentence is C spot run. So how do you parse the sentence C spot run? What part of speech is the word run? And I haven't met an English teacher who knew the answer to this, but we have no problem understanding the sentence, even though we can't formally parse it. And in fact, um, uh, I think it was Russell Baker wrote a column in the New York, Sunday New York Times so it's called same. On Language. And he had an entire column on this sentence. So you can ask your kids and grandkids, how do you parse C-spot run? <laughs> well, great. I need Thank to bow out myself. So Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Me too. Thank you. Peace, everyone.